Why is windowing needed in discrete time sampling? Well, let's start by thinking about continuous time. And here we've got a sampled sinusoidal waveform in continuous time. The period of the sine wave is capital P and the sampling period is capital T. And I've drawn this for a case where capital P equals eight times capital T. In the frequency domain, the Fourier transform, of course, there will be spikes at one on P. That's the frequency of this sinusoid that has a period of P. And because we've sampled it, there will be copies appearing at one on T and negative one on T and so on, two on T, negative two on T and so on. And for more information about the Fourier transform of a sampled waveform, uh, check out the show notes for this video. You'll find lots of videos on sampling explaining all of this process. So now we're going to think about measuring this signal for just a finite amount of time, not over the infinite amount of time that this goes for. Now to take that measurement window, we're going to multiply our sequence by this windowing function. And it's just like a looking out of a window of a house and not seeing the full landscape from horizon to horizon. Uh, you're just seeing the portion that you can see out of the window. So when we multiply the, this waveform here by this function here, which is zero here and zero here uh, and one in between, we're just going to be windowing this signal. That's what we mean by windowing. Now the Fourier transform of this is, which is a rect function, the Fourier transform is this sync function. The first zero is one on nt, and I've drawn this example for n equals eight. Of course, you can window for any length of time uh, that you might like to. I'm just choosing this to start with, just to make a point as we'll see in a minute. Okay, now because we're multiplying these in the time domain, we're gonna be convolving these two in the frequency domain. Again, check out the show notes for videos that explain that process. So here now we've multiplied these two together to get this function, which is zero all here and zero all here. And that means we've convolved these two in the frequency domain. And if you convolve a function with a delta function, then the function appears at the location of the delta function. So this function here is appearing at one on P, uh, negative one on P, and then these other values up here of frequency. So this is the Fourier transform that you have once you have windowed your sampled waveform. Okay, this was all continuous time. Now let's think about this discrete time. So what happens in discrete time? Well, when we take this sampled waveform in continuous time and represent it in discrete time, the only thing we take are the values that are within this window. And they simply form a sequence of numbers which we can write down in a numbered ordered list. So there's nothing out here at negative time. There's nothing at any time bigger than the maximum of our window. We simply have, in this case, seven numbers. And that's very important uh, difference between the discrete time and the continuous time. So what do we have in the frequency domain? Well, now we don't have the Fourier transform anymore. We have the discrete Fourier transform. In fact, the uh, a, another version of that or an implementation of that is more commonly known as the fast Fourier transform, the FFT. So now we only have this finite length of numbers, sequence of numbers. And when we take the DFT or the FFT, this is what we get. And in this case, it matches up perfectly with what we were expecting to get. There's nothing in the first element. If we look up here, it matches up with where the peak is here. There's a zero here matches with this, a zero matches here, zero here, and so on. And then this one matches with this peak here. And these of course correspond exactly to the ones which are in the top diagram here. So in the top diagram, when we had the signal that went forever and was not windowed, we just had these continuous time delta functions at this value here and this value here. Now in the discrete Fourier transform where we have windowed it, we get exactly matching delta functions, but these are discrete delta functions now because this is just a sequence of numbers. But it all makes sense and hopefully you can see the alignment between discrete time and continuous time. So 
Uh, we've windowed this here with a square window and we got what we were hoping to get in terms of a discrete time representation of what we expect, which are these single delta functions. So what's the problem? Why do we need different types of windowing shapes? Well, the, the, to see this, let's consider a scenario where we ha I haven't chosen P to be exactly an integer multiple of capital T. So let's take P to be, for example, a slightly less than N times T. So what does that mean? That means we're still sampling over the same windowed period, so our window remains the same. But now let's consider if our signal that we had were, were measuring, if the signal had a slightly smaller period, so it had slightly higher frequency, then this all would be compressed in towards the left because P would be smaller. And then what is that going to uh, impact on our discrete Fourier transform? Well, uh, if we think through the steps of what the impact of that, then one on P is now going to be a bigger number. So this arrow here moves out to the right. This does not change because we're still windowing over the same period of time. And so now this would be moved out to the right. And so in the frequency domain, if I'm drawing the equivalent for, for this one here, which is of our uh, windowed function, now the one on P means that this function here is a little bit more to the right. And of course, this one will be a little bit more to the left. And so this one will now be coming in and looking like this. And now we won't be getting any more our signals where they all match up uh, with zeros at the one on P multiples. Now they're overlapping. We don't have those zeros anymore. And it means that when we go to the discrete time version, we're not going to have this nice function anymore that just has these single spikes because here these were zero everywhere that corresponded to the other values in our FFT, but now they are no longer zero anymore because they all overlap. Of course, the same thing is happening for these ones up here as well uh, and these ones down here. So now all we did was to change the frequency of our waveform slightly, we made P slightly less than the integer uh, relationship, slightly less so that P on T was no longer an integer, slightly less, and all of a sudden our entire FFT vector fills up. Our entire DFT or FFT vector fills up now. So now if we were to try to be working out what the actual sinusoidal frequency was in our measured waveform, we have a much harder job. In this case here, uh, you can still go and pick the peak. If you knew that there was only one frequency in your signal, then you could pick the peak from here and say, well, it corresponds to this one here, which is at one and seven corresponds to this. And you could uh, take that to be your estimate. But how do you know, in fact, that you don't have other frequency components in your, in your signal? because you could have had frequency components that correspond to this FFT having spikes at two or three uh, and, and so on. Uh, whereas here, uh, you wouldn't know. Was it that there was two frequency components in here? One that corresponds to one, another one that corresponds to two? Or did you only have one and it was corresponding to a, to a frequency that is not an integer multiple, and which is the case here? So this is the challenge, and this is why you need windowing. You need different shapes of windows here. Clearly, these values in this particular case here, the values that aren't at one and seven, they are related to the side lobes of this sinusoidal function. So the sine lobes from this function here. If you took this function to be wider, then this would be narrower, and then you would have a bigger fall off in these values. Uh, so that means there's a benefit to measuring for a longer period of time if you can, if your signal allows you to. Um, but if you're going to be restricted in this, then what else can you do to lower the side lobes? Well, you can change the shape of this function. And that's for all the other different windowing that you have uh, might have seen, the different shapes. And if you want a video that explains different types of windowing and what windowing is, Again, check out the show notes of the video uh, and you'll find links to another video on what windowing is that explains different shapes of windows and how it can affect those side lobes. 
So if this video has helped you to understand the need for windowing in discrete time sampling, uh, like the video, it helps others to find it. Uh, of course, check out the description below. As I've said, you'll find a web page with a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos.